Welcome to Incredible Idaho. I'm Wayne Walker. Tonight we begin our show by floating the Salmon River through the Stanley Basin. Now, what could be finer than a crisp autumn day spent on the river? But I gotta be a little bit honest with you. It's more than crisp today, it's downright cold. But we're surrounded by the magnificent craggy peaks of the Sawtooth Mountains, and we're all ready to go. How's that? Still snug, yep. As the weather so convincingly reminds us, we've caught the tail end of the floating season. It's a time when river running becomes more technical, a game of bumping and weaving through the rocks. But the crew is a hardy bunch, ready to brave weather and wet. And our guides, well, aside from a few theatrics on the loading dock, are game to go. <laughs> when you're asked to paddle, we expect you to be paddling, helping out the boat. And when not, you're just sitting there with it resting on your lap. We review paddling techniques and commands, then get a lesson on how to pull a fellow passenger back into our boat. I'm going to say, Sylvia, are you ready? Let's go on three. One, two, and three. This time of year, we're more likely to fall out of the boat from an unexpected bump against a rock rather than a surge of white water. We load up, looking forward to a scenic trip and an extra bonus, the opportunity to see a rare sight endangered Chinook salmon building their spawning nests. It's uh, a unique chance for people from urban areas to, to get close to something that is mysterious and almost gone. And the story of the salmon in, in itself has uh, attracted a lot of attention from our guests. But then being able to see one up close at this time of the year in the actual act of spawning in the river is really a treat for our guests. Stop. Down river, we'll have to portage, getting out of our rafts and carrying them around the section of the stream where the salmon are spawning. Although it can be an imposition for the outfitter, our guide service today, the river company has turned it into an educational opportunity. It's become the highlight of a trip that features a running commentary on the geological characteristics, wildlife, and historical sites we pass along the way. So this is the uh, O'Brien Bridge. This is a historic bridge in this area which connects the old stagecoach road, which we're going to be walking down during the portage. Our first clue that we're near our portage spot is the sound of music. As we round the bend, we catch the sight of outfitter Erasmo Palo jamming on his clarinet, serenading us into the takeout spot. Hi. It's a great break, a chance to stretch our legs and enjoy some more music in the great outdoors. Also, an opportunity to build up our biceps. Okay, one, two, three. The portage is about a half mile, a pleasant walk down the old stagecoach road surrounded by pines and aspen. We crest a small ridge overlooking the river at a place called Indian Riffle, a shallow section where the gravelly bottom is clearly visible. What we're going to see is we're going to see a salmon spawning bed, which is called a red. And these are the few fish that are strong enough to make it 900 miles all the way from the ocean. So their primary purpose in life is to come all the way back up here through the Columbia, the snake, and the salmon to find this spot to spawn. Now, the best way to view them is to be quiet. And what we're going to see out here is a big red, and that's that cleared off area. About 30 feet from shore, you can see where it's cleared off. Right at the bottom of that red is a big salmon, which looks like a big rock until it moves. This is probably a female. She may already have laid her eggs in a nest built into the gravel bed. In a few days, she'll die, and her decomposing body will feed scavenging wildlife, also adding essential nutrients back into the waters of the Salmon River. Portaging around this area is a requirement imposed by the federal government, but for guide Mike Strain, uh, it's an easy choice. It's and the big concern is whether we'd 
draw attention or whether that fish would notice us. If that fish noticed us, it might get scared and swim away and exert more energy doing that than it would need to actually protecting its bed. The problems so, uh, threatening Idaho salmon aren't found here in the spawning habitat. The, the obstacles are downstream in the form of eight dams built across the Lower there, Snake and Columbia Rivers. But the few salmon who manage to make it back through those barriers will spawn undisturbed by today's floaters. All right, guys, thanks for foraging with us. Makes it easy when you guys don't mind doing that, of course. Uh, we're going to get back in the boats here and go about another five miles to our lunch site, which is going to be our takeout. Looks like we might be having some weather behind us. So uh, we'll get going and hopefully miss a lot of this rain that might be behind us. So, Well, the dark clouds catch up with us in no time. Bringing a cold, steady rain, <laughs> this is we're about to enter the last yeah. rapids of the day. Let's paddle off forward. And stop. This is Indian Head Rock right here. Very lucrative gold mine off to our right. One of the more lucrative on the Salmon River, the upper salmon stretch. I don't know how the guy ever got in here, but he did it. Let's go forward. Keep paddling, stop. Kind of drift down through these rocks. Give me left back, quickly! All forward! Stop! Beautiful. Although we're wet and a little bit cold, the whole crew is smiling. Despite the weather, it's been a great day. But the trip will be remembered because of our walk around Indian Riffles. The image of that lone, determined salmon will haunt us. I used to come up here when I was a kid in the, in the late 40s with my dad and uh, a friend of his from Ketchum and, uh, and, and, and see this uh, river teeming with, with the Chinooks. And uh, in a way today, seeing that red with uh, the one lonely Chinook on it uh, was, uh, was, was touching. Uh, in, in, in so many different ways, it touched me so many different ways, is how could it have happened? Um, and boy, do I admire that fish that got up here. I, I got a lot of emotion looking at that today. Uh, and it, it just makes me think back at, you know, it was a long time ago, but not that long ago to have that big a change in, in our natural resources. <laughs> We got here a flake hatch. <laughs> yeah, white midge. For many of Idaho's anglers, nothing beats fishing in the fall. And our next story will take you to a place called Copper Basin in the Pioneer Mountains east of Sun Valley, where the scenery is spectacular, and so are the trout. That is, if you're lucky enough to hook one. You say you thought you saw a rise down in? Yeah, in the pond right there. Right down there. Want to take a look at that? Yeah, let's do it. Looks good. Okay. 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 This looks pretty decent. Actually, there are two, what, two ponds there? And yeah. I thought well, I saw a fish rise in that one when we drove up. That's that middle one. I'm willing to give it a go. Yeah. All right, let's, let's try it. I used to be real fast at this. No, I'm not fast at all anymore. <laughs> I remember, I remember the first time I went to a steelhead river with my two kid brothers, and my theory then about all fishing was the the first guy in the water. <laughs> was the guy that won? Was the, the guy who won? Won the prize. <laughs> Okie dokie. What are you gonna use? What are you gonna start with? Oh, I think it's a. 
I don't think, you know, I don't think selectivity is going to be a problem here. I think something very, fairly small and dark. Oh, I'm going to try one of these little uh, CDC caddis, the ones that are tied with the duck Yeah, that, duck I don't feather. think you can go wrong with that. Well, maybe this little uh, early season snowstorm will get them started. Get, get these fish thinking they, they better load up on food before winter gets here. Well, I hope they're here. Yeah. I don't know if this stuff is jiggly or not. It's jiggly, we're steering fish already. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that looks good. It does look good, doesn't it? Well, I'll just go uh, swim a little nip through here for just see what happens. Well, you generally don't catch many fish. It's just a great place. It's pretty. It's uh, particularly this time of year. Yeah, this is a little small. I'll try that beaver pond right there and make a better cast. Boy, there ought to be some, ought to be some little brook trout in here. Should I go up above it? Yeah, I think above it. Or around on the other side. There he is, right there. He's probably the only one in here. <laughs> Mike. Hey. There he is. He, he came to it that time. Did he? Yeah. What do we got here? A flake hatch. <laughs> yeah. White midge. I think these fish learn too quickly. Yeah. <laughs> That's why they call it fishing. Not catching, I guess. You know, we might as well catch a couple of fish since we're going fishing. <laughs> oh, there he is. <laughs> Son of a gun. Maybe he's ready for me now. Can, can you reach him there? Well, I could, except I reached the grass behind me first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's figured out exactly how far it is between us. <laughs> You're right. I, I should be drifting over him. You should be. I want to find some stupider fish somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Wanna go down below? Whatever you whatever you feel like it. Vamonos. This stretch, Mike. I generally found that you catch six or seven white fish and then you'll you'll pick up a real nice trout you know oh i could go for it i could go for either one <laughs> me too, me too. <laughs> anything yeah. that bends the rod <laughs> you know the people i think people denigrate white fish too much they're actually pretty nice fish well they've been here a long time longer than the rainbow that's yeah for sure. absolutely <laughs> Yeah, we spent a lot of time together doing this one way or another. And, uh, had some great times, particularly steelhead fishing, which I guess I'd probably just about rather do than anything. And I'm not sure there's many fish in here. Yeah, you get discouraged. It's always more fun to catch a few. Let's go steelheading. Still steelheading. We're going to be this cold. We just will be pursuing something large, huh? I think a lot of it actually is the casting. Fly casting is a lot of fun. It's got a real nice feel to it. It's something you can always get better at. Finally had a strike. <laughs> Says he finally had a strike. Oh my God, there may be fish here after all. Well, there's a couple of fish working, raising down here. Oh, it's a little rainbow, not very big, but... Feisty little guy. Oh, he's nice. Yeah, that's a nice little fish. It's, uh... 
It's a wild fish. Yeah. Oh, there's another one. Let's see if we can catch this other one here. The salmon in this river had both a spiritual and practical value to the Native Americans of this area. Their culture has long recognized the bond between man and Earth's resources and honored that tie in ritual dance. Next, we'll take you to a Native American powwow, a celebration of our Earth and its bounty. Uh, our great spirits uh, the one who watches over the land, who's created the soil, who's created the breath of buffalo, made of wind and rain. The one who gave each of us a spirit, blessing us with our individuality, giving us power and strength in our Indian world, in our traditions, keeping it alive. So wonderful to be alive in this world of humanity because we are so special and you have given us and made us this way to be beautiful Indian people, to be proud in what we do. Derek Davis, a Native American of the Hopi Choctaw tribe, says to watch us dance is to hear our hearts speak. No words are necessary. The steady drum beat and the graceful flowing movements captivate and mesmerize the spectator. A kind of spell is woven as the dancers flow in and out, tying into a tradition that spans the centuries. It's more spiritual, you know, to, because you're related to the earth. You're, you're thanking God for all the blessings that you have received, like, like all the animals. Uh, the, you know, you're thankful that they gave you the, that animal to, you know, to kill so you could eat, so you could wear the skins. The fundamental connection between Native Americans and wildlife is evident in traditional dances like this one, performed by Tim Yellowtail of the Crow Nation. It honors a native wild bird of the Great Plains called the prairie chicken, imitating the movements of its mating dance. Tim is such an accomplished dancer that he was asked to perform before the world at the Olympic Games in Atlanta. <laughs> The powwow is being hosted by members of the Shoshone Paiute tribe in honor of their elders. The three-day celebration includes games, food, and the highlight, dancing competitions. LaDonna Rose and her sister Ashley are performing the jingle dance. Mom's responsible for the beautiful handiwork involved in making the costumes, but the girls chose the vibrant colors. It's the colors of the sunset when it sets. Many of the costumes also display a reverence for wildlife. 14-year-old Derek Gibson explains the significance of his splendid attire. I guess a bunch of equal feathers that represents the tail of an equal muscle. Derek will be performing a dance called the Northern Traditional, what he calls a sort of two-step. Fourteen tiny tots kick off the dance competition with a mix of enthusiasm and uncertainty. Next is the Junior Girls Jingle, a dance of intricate steps accompanied by the light tinkling sound of the dancers' costumes. Nine-year-old Ashley Rose of the sunset color dress will earn a second place prize as she dances in the footsteps of her ancestors. A small, graceful girl echoing the proud tradition of centuries.
Thanks for being with us. We hope you've enjoyed yourself as much as we have on this trip. And we'll leave you tonight with Fall in Idaho. <laughs>